Well, hello and welcome indeed to this breakout session on a mission-oriented approach to stakeholder capitalism. I'm Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics, which has been partnering Aspen Ideas on, on Reset. Uh, we, we've been spending these two days, all these sessions, uh, thinking about how to reset the economy, make it deliver more for people and rise to generational challenges such as climate change and inclusion. And so I'm especially delighted to have uh, this conversation with my friend Mariana Matacata. Mariana is professor in the e uh, professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London. Uh, she's published well. She's already published two books that changed the way I think about a lot of important stuff. One of them was effectively asking readers to reset the way they thought about the role of the public sector and the contribution of the public sector. That was the entrepreneurial state debunking public versus private sector myths. And another one, which is as someone who's interested in the history of economic ideas is particularly close to my heart, the value of everything making and taking in the global economy, which absolutely, if you haven't read it, people listening, uh, it just nailed the way that a particular conception of value had permeated uh, and in many ways subverted the way we think about the economy and society. And now she's got a new one, uh, uh, which is about something completely different, although definitely consistent with what her thinking has been before. Uh, it's out in the US next month, but I know that Mariana is very keen for you to know that you can pre-order it in the US. Um, Mission Economy, a moonshot guide to changing capitalism. Uh, Mariana, uh, welcome to Reset and thank you for being here. Um, now, I know from hearing you speak before that actually it's quite good to let you get your ideas off your chest initially, and then we and then we can have a conversation. And actually, we've already got lots of questions coming in, so I think already? we're going to hear. I know we had questions. Some people have read the book already. Um, Great. So, so I think we're going to hear from you for a few minutes, just describing the book, and then we'll have have more of a chat. Yes, a full 15 minutes they've given me. So thank you, Stephanie, first of all. I really appreciate that you accepted to uh, moderate this session. So the book actually came out last month in the UK and it's coming out um, in the US in March, as you said. I'm not gonna share the screen because this is always the tricky bit where the danger is always that you end up sharing your emails, but hopefully that's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, do you see, Stephanie, can you just say if you see my slides? And just say yes or no, yes? Yes. I don't hear you talking. I assume so, unless someone yells out, we don't see anything. All good, yeah? Okay. It's all good. So what I'd love to do is spend the next, oh God, I've already used one minute, uh, 14 minutes, <laughs> um, talking about why the notion of stakeholder capitalism, which sounds great, and it is great, um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be instead of just maximizing share prices and all the things that we know can go wrong with that kind of short-termism, why actually to concretize it, it really needs to go to the center of the system. It cannot just be a concept around corporate governance, whether we agree with it or not. It has to go to the center of how different value creators actually interact. And it has to essentially change the social contract between business and the state. And if it doesn't do that, then it's really just kind of you know, a waffly concept. And I do believe that we can make it a more interesting concept. And the idea that, you know, 50 years ago, we did a really difficult thing, which is to go to the moon and back after Kennedy set that uh, goal in 1962. And it required an immense amount of both public and private investment in innovation, but also their relationship was truly purpose driven. Another kind of sexy and trendy word we often hear in the Aspen and Davos kinds of uh, uh, places. So what does it mean to unpack? What does a purpose driven partnership look like. And that's what I want to talk about. And I think that really, there's no time like the current one, uh, where this message is, you know, extremely important, because really, the COVID-19 moment has thrown us so many different challenges, whether it's the digital divide, and many of us with children at home know that not all kids are getting educated the same way. So that's a problem that really requires both public and private partnerships. We have the test and trace system, the personal protection equipment for frontline workers, the vaccine. These are all different examples of problems that can only be solved together. And yet on all those different fronts, 
one can say that we have, you know, let's leave the vaccine issue uh, to the side just for a minute, but definitely in terms of preparedness <laughs> of our systems, we have in so many different countries really failed. Um, and by the way, what's really interesting on that, and we might get to it in the q and is that some countries that are still in their developmental pathway, um, like Kerala region and India and Vietnam have actually done quite well compared to some advanced industrialized countries. And I'd like to come back to that later so we don't just have kind of a Euro and US centric uh, view of what I'll be talking about. But also the COVID-19 crisis really came on the back of other types of crises. The biggest one of course being the climate one. You'll remember that in February last year, the month before COVID became a household term, we were not looking at uh, you know, essential workers in hospitals. Uh, we were looking at flood workers in Venice, the part of Italy where I'm from, actually Padova, 20 minutes away from Venice, or uh, you know, fire workers in, Aust in um, Australia and in California. And the really tragic thing about the climate crisis is we're simply not moving fast enough. Already the IPCC report told us uh, two years ago that we only had 10 years left, and yet just last year, in the European Union, so 2019, we had 55 billion in subsidies uh, go out to fossil fuel companies and 56% of the COVID-19 recovery funding in 2020 was actually allocated to energy companies that are still based on fossil fuel projects. So there's no way that we can really say that we're moving at the speed that you know people like Greta Thornburg, now an 18 year old tells us we should be, you know, when your house is on fire, stop debating, get the hell out. Same kind of thing with the climate crisis. We have to move quickly. We cannot just sit there and debate the problem, whether it exists or not. And of course, we also have the 17 sustainable development goals that, you know, sometimes people forget these were agreed on internationally by every single country five years ago or 2015, now almost six years ago. And underneath these 17, uh, goals are 169 targets. And there as well, if you look at the different metrics and the different institutions, especially within the United Nations, that look at this in terms of how globally we are getting our acts together, unfortunately, the report card is equally uh, not that great. And all of this is happening in the context of another big debate, which is the one I opened up with, which is, you know, businesses really reflecting, at least in words, and in conferences like your own, uh, that we need to change corporate governance. That you know this this extraction of value, which I talked about in the book, the value of everything, the kind of you know record level share buybacks in the last ten years, four trillion dollars have gone to buying back shares by the uh, Fortune 500 companies. This is not the way to run a, a society in terms of a corporate uh, business model. So whether it's Larry Fink or uh, 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 the the Business Roundtable putting out the statement over a year ago about, you know, we need to rethink that model in terms of reinvesting back into long run areas that help people, planet, working conditions, and so on. And this conversation is a very important one. We shouldn't dismiss it. Uh, some of us, you know, maybe believe that that as well is not moving fast enough, but it's a very important one. Um, and, you know, if we remind ourselves that markets are not the same thing as business, markets are outcomes of how we govern business and how we govern other types of value creating institutions, we also you know, present ourselves with the problem, which is how is government governed? How is the public sector governed? And what I've been writing about now for some years is that we also have a problem there. It's not just corporate governance that needs to rethink itself, it's also kind of government governance. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, the fact that economic theory, and I don't want to blame economists, of which I'm one, for everything, but the fact that economic theory itself has at best framed the role of the public sector, the state, and policy as simply fixing market failures is part of the problem. All those different, you know, issues that I raised in terms of the health crisis, the climate crisis, the massive shift we need in order to address the sustainable development goals, we're not gonna get there by simply putting different types of patches on the system. And the market failure approach, which forces government to always ask, where is the market failure? How am I gonna fix it? Whether it's a negative externality with a, a carbon tax or a positive externality with uh, basic research funding or other types of public goods, that's an important framework, but it's very hard to fix your way towards transformational growth. And by transformational growth, by the way, I don't just mean these kind of big social objectives like health and, and climate, I also mean literally in terms of the direction of growth. And you'll know from a lot of the literature that the kind of growth that got us a financial crisis over 10 years ago was an ultra financialized form of growth. And in the UK where I'm standing today, 
the kind of growth we have continues to be consumption-led growth, which has really led to a, a, a very high uh, ratio, for example, of private debt to disposable income, not public debt, but private debt to disposable income. So shifting that growth model from consumption to investment-led growth and innovation-driven growth and having that investment and innovation help us solve some you know, really important problems uh, like the ones around climate, health, and the sustainable development goals need a different approach to policymaking, one that I call uh, actively shaping and co-creating markets alongside business, not just fixing markets. And one thing that I found very curious in the UK was um, you know, a lot of the uh, data that's come out since Brexit and now with COVID has been showing just how much the government has been overly relying on consulting companies, Deloitte that ended up uh, being asked to roll out the test and trace system and didn't do too well, but also with Brexit, the KPMGs, PricewaterhouseCoopers and so on, which ended up almost managing, project managing Brexit for the government, this over consultification of government a Tory lord, Agnew, who you see here in the picture, uh, said that this was leading to an infantilized public sector. Um, and this is very interesting because when you admit, which I think is something crucial to stakeholder value, that value is created collectively, we need to ask ourselves, do we have the dynamic capabilities within organizations, both public and private, um, that actually allow that value to be co-created, including the capabilities of how do you actually partner with each other. And when you start outsourcing your brain, as I think the US government has done in the recent years also in terms of IT, one could uh, view the whole NSA kind of Snowden scandal as an outcome of the government almost losing its capability to govern information, computing and the technology uh, revolution, that you have a problem, not just within that organization, but in terms of the partnerships that are fostered. So this is the reason that in the recent book that I wrote, I asked, well, hold on a second, you know, we can do better. And only 50 years ago, public and private sectors worked together extremely ambitiously um, to get to the moon and back, you know, that, that uh, famous uh, uh, goal that Kennedy set back in 1962. Um, the, the problems we have today are much trickier, actually. There's wicked problems. They require political, behavioral, regulatory change, not just technological change, but it was truly a partnership. There was both business and government doing incredibly different, th uh, sorry, difficult things. And what was especially interesting to me is how government through NASA, but also some other public institutions paid a lot of attention to the how to partner with business. And they even looked at the contracts and undid the existing contracts. And I'll come to that in a minute. But the kind of leadership that was required by government to set the direction of change and then catalyze a lot of risk taking bottom up amongst different actors in society and the attention also to the agility and flip flexibility of the government institutions themselves this focus on an outcomes based budgeting so you know kennedy's speech was very clear this is going to cost a huge amount of money uh, but it's going to be worth it and focusing on the goal and then backtracking on the budget all these are just really interesting lessons i think today as we need to build back better, that famous slogan, but especially rethink the organizations that we have in both government and in business. And you know, what's quite striking is that when Kennedy uh, you know, ha uh, did his speech, they had no clue how to get to the moon. So literally the innovation and risk taking, the experimentation that was, requ that was required was immense. Uh, they ended up you know, landing on this lunar orbit rendezvous way, but they were really exploring all sorts of different techniques. And on the tragic day in which Apollo 1, the fire occurred, one of the astronauts said something that I think is just so important, which was, we can't even talk to each other through different uh, NASA kind of mission control rooms. How are we gonna get to the moon? He was talking about the very siloed, linear, vertical, bureaucratic form in which the state itself was structured. And he was basically saying, if we're gonna be purpose driven, using today's words and get to the moon and back in a generation, we're gonna to have to rethink actually how we communicate within our own structures. And that kind of attention to organizational change was something that NASA through George Mueller's leadership really embarked on. And this is important, right? Because if you are gonna be purpose driven, what does it mean for your own organizational culture, not just in business, but also in government? And the purpose, this notion of a partnership with a common purpose is really what I think is so important in terms of allowing us to give more substance to this notion of uh, stakeholder capitalism. It was so curious that they paid attention not only to the procurement contracts in terms of how to 
devise them so government wouldn't be uh, just, if you want, vulnerable to paying any costs that were presented to them through cost price uh, contracts, which they changed to fixed price contracts with incentives for innovation. But they also paid attention to making sure that this enterprise that they were going to do together, this wonderful, difficult mission, wasn't just going to become a gambling casino. So they even had clauses like no excess profits clauses uh, in the procurement contracts. And of course, profits were earned, but there was also real kind of risk sharing and reward sharing in the process. And so sharing both risks and rewards, I think, is incredibly important. And again, NASA was very clear that they had to be aware of just getting kind of conned by any you know, company that would come along and say, oh, we'll help you. And they called it, you know, be aware of brochuremanship. This was the years before we had these wonderful PowerPoints that we use today. Uh, but this idea that you know, NASA itself required its own capabilities, investing within its own brain, what I call the dynamic capabilities of the public sector, in order even to know how to write the terms of reference with business to foster a symbiotic and mutualistic uh, partnership. And what was so special about the moon landing was so much happened along the way, spillovers across many different sectors. It wasn't just aeronautics, it was nutrition, materials, electronics, the entire software industry in some ways was an outcome of that. And that really did happen because of a kind of top down, you know, mission setting, but lots of bottom up experimentation. And that kind of delicate uh, balance between the two is really what I focus on in the book for allowing us to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, really create a concrete investment pathway and trajectory for the SDGs. I won't go into this because I don't have much time, but it did cost uh, a lot of money, but not as much as Kennedy was very clear as we spend on cigarettes and cigars, but also really what is, is so important is the how. It wasn't just public money thrown down from helicopters. It was done through an ambitious uh, decentralized network of different public uh, actors alongside the whole innovation chain with the private sector, something I also talk about in my book, The Entrepreneurial State. So coming back to the SDGs, these are the earth shots. They're much harder actually than a purely technological missions. A colleague of mine wrote a book back in the 70s about this, Dick Nelson, called The Moon and the Ghetto. But they can be tackled if we treat them with the same amount of urgency and seriousness as we treat wars or that moon landing. And what that really requires is again, partnership with purpose, but also being very clear that the SDGs are the challenges that we have. We've signed up to it, so if we're not interested, let's take our names off that list. Transforming them into missions that require lots of different sectors to collaborate and innovate together. But the real interest that I kind of focus on in the book and also in policy work I've done, for example, through this report with the European Commission, on the back of which missions are now a, a tool that the commission uses in the Horizon program, is really how to design then procurement, grants, and loans to foster that bottom-up uh, innovation. I have more to say, but because my time is up, I will stop sharing the screen and make sure that some of what I wanted to talk about in the next slides, I bring up in the Q&A. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you that one of them is how to govern this process for the public good. Well, uh, I hope I can, uh, I can get, I'm going to provide lots of opportunities for you to talk more, Mariana, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, but I think, I guess just to get one thing out of the way first, you know, there will be people listening, certainly people who've heard a lot about stakeholder capitalism before, and indeed maybe sitting in businesses trying to make it work. Um, there'll be others who are just used to managing people and getting things done, and they'll say, it's not very complicated. If you actually want to make progress, you need to set a big target and then work as a team to meet it. You know, why do I need a whole book to tell me that? What What is different about what you're actually, what, what you're proposing? Because this isn't just happening. about having a mission. Yeah. Exactly. So um, for me, at least, missions are about, again, how do you partner in a different way? So let's even unpick, for example, um, you know, any of the goals like, you know, SDG 14 around clean oceans. What does it mean actually to transform it into a very concrete goal, like getting 90% of the plastic out of the ocean, and make sure that the way that government interacts with business, which it's constantly interacting in terms of subsidies, guarantees, grants, and loans, becomes actually conditional on you know, business and different types of businesses, which will actually re require different types of support, uh, uh, investing in that goal together. And even though that sounds really obvious, it simply doesn't happen. I mean, I've looked at so many different sectors, especially, by the way, the pharmaceutical sector, which gets all sorts of benefits from government. In the United States, $40 billion a year, 
goes towards drug innovation. And somehow then we don't get that kind of conditionality and partnership right. So intellectual property rights in particular for that sector are often abused. They are too upstream, they're too wide, used for strategic patenting, they're too uh, strong, so hard to license. The prices of the drugs don't actually reflect that collective value creation. And so, you know, governing the partnership, governing innovation in such a way as serious as NASA was when it unpicked those procurement contracts and said, nope, this isn't gonna be good, we're gonna be taken for a ride, and truly sharing both risks and rewards means doing things quite differently. And the vaccine, which is a great example actually today of uh, you know, both the public and the private sector putting in a lot of money. Don't forget Oxford is a public university. People in the US sometimes forget that. <laughs> uh, but also you know, it was based on a lot of previous funding, the Oxford vaccine from also the European Commission, as was by the way, the Pfizer vaccine, which got money from the European Commission and the German uh, uh, government. Um, so these are all kind of ecosystems, public and private investments that produce something like a vaccine. But then if you don't govern it, right, to meet, let's just call it the common good, then that's a problem in terms of the deal. And one of the ways that this is currently being tried, at least insisted on, one could argue from the World Health Organization, is through the messaging that we need to make sure we're fostering not just private profits, but collective intelligence. So the idea of a patent pool for the vaccine, but also making sure the vaccine is universally accessible so we don't have what Dr. Tedros called vaccine apartheid, so countries just hoarding it. That's all about kind of governing that process, right, in a particular way. And you could unpick the same thing with digital platforms. You know, everything that makes our smart products smart and not stupid was funded by government, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. And yet then if you don't govern that innovation for the public good, you end up with what I was arguing in the beginning, kind of too little, too late, worried about privacy, taxation, always kind of in the back saying, oh, wait, 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 hold on, as opposed to making sure you have kind of you know, what I call pre-distribution, uh, which is a nice term also that others use, which is how do we get the conditions right ex ante so you don't have to pick the, up the mess ex post. And that to me is central to a mission-oriented approach where purpose is at the center of the relationship as opposed to just kind of a siloed notion of how corporate governance can improve. I'm going to be, so we're going to try and be kind of ruthlessly practical in this session and think about how it applies to the, the new administration, but any, any government who's trying to think about how to change the way we do these things. Um, but your mention of the vaccine, I think, is actually helpful on one of the points. I mean, you say yourself in the book that there are, there are ways in which the moon landings are not a helpful uh, guide for now and for the challenges we face now. One of one is that it was sort of chosen by a quite narrow part of society that we were going to go to moon and maybe not everyone would have signed up for that. Um, but another is that it is it is quite a sort of clear technical challenge, enormously ambitious and difficult, but easily explained and with a quite clear process leading up to it. Um, where uh, And I think you could say the vaccines are actually an even better example of that, you know, a very clearly defined target. Some of the sustainable development goals would have that characteristic. They're quite specific. But when you think about something that you're obviously very focused on and you have applied this to, I mean, climate change, so many layers of that that are not just technical, they are also social, they're also about how we value, you know, going back to your other book about how we value things. Um, so I just, where do you get to the point where it's less helpful to have this kind of parallel? Um, you know, how yeah. can you use this approach for something which is more social and more multi-layered? Uh, thanks for that question, it's very important. So, um, you know, what's interesting is, you know, Many people remember that, that famous uh, story that the janitor who uh, worked in NASA when he was asked, what do you do? And he said, I'm helping to get a man on the moon. So in, in some sense, you know, what also the moon landing did was really inspire so many different people, including lots of kids who ended up studying science, you know, because of the inspiration. But it wasn't, you know, citizens weren't engaged in the design, you know, of the mission itself. It, you know, it really was top down. Some of the more interesting missions that we're working on in the Institute that I run at University College London, which is called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, you know, the whole notion of purpose at the center of political economy, um, are on missions in countries like Sweden, where the national mission is so interesting. It's about a fossil free welfare state. 
And then if you break down everything the state does and provides from public transport, public education, public health, a lot of that is actually obviously in partnership with business. Um, but what does it mean to land those, those ambitions in concrete places? Take the, um, the uh, uh, public education system. You know, if you have a carbon neutral agenda, a fossil free welfare state agenda, it can actually land in a place like school meals, right? So you can have the production, distribution, and consumption of school meals driven by this carbon neutral agenda. But what would it look like to bring kids to the table, students in schools to the table to design that, but also to monitor it along the way? You know, if the food is sustainable, but kind of sucks and it's not very tasty, that's not gonna work. Um, so that both the issue of co-design, but also monitoring along the way is an important point. And in Camden, the part of London where I live, we were just exchanging where we live in London. Both of us are in London, not in uh, Colorado. <laughs> um, in Camden, I co-chair the Camden Renewal Commission with Georgia Gould, the leader of the council. And one of the things we've started doing is thinking about carbon neutrality with the place where it lands is the social housing estates, what in the US they call housing projects. And again, what does it mean to bring housing associations or citizen assemblies to the table to really talk and debate and contest about how do we want to live together in these places so that it is not just sustainable, but it's also an outcome of you know, a discussion. And by the way, an artist that I've been working with in recent years, Oliver Eliasson, we're actually co-curating the UN pavilion at the Venice Biennale, it should have happened last year, but it's happening this May. He has this wonderful definition of public space as a space where you feel uh, safe to disagree. Right. So how do you create spaces like citizen assemblies where people can truly kind of disagree and debate, but it doesn't become the kind of hate speech that you know, we witness on social media, but it does become a place where people think together. And you know, governments aren't very prepared for that, actually. You know, it's easy to pet Greta Thornburg on the head and say, oh, how cute, you know, 16 or 18 year old now cares about climate change. But what does it mean to listen to social movements? And that's really important, by the way, because it's not just, you know, the green movement, it's also the labor movement. Uh, labor at as a record, labor is at a record low in terms of the labor share of GDP globally. The profit share is at a record high. Uh, labor unions, trade unions have historically been incredibly important for shaping markets to be more inclusive. We wouldn't have weekends, by the way, not that as a social innovation. We wouldn't have the eight hour workday without trade unions. So, you know, whether it's the labor movement, whether it's the, a green movement, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's the care workers today in that movement, what does it mean for governments themselves to listen, to actually allow that to be part of the process through which emissions are set? And in Germany, sorry, I feel like I'm talking too much. I'll just say one last thing quickly. In Germany, I think what's interesting is they've had one of the strongest green movements um, uh, across the globe. And the energy vende policy, which is in no way perfect, uh, is very much an outcome of the green agenda really having risen slowly up to the, to the very high level of government. And that ended up fostering a very different relationship between government and business. So a couple of years ago when the steel industry ask government for a loan and a bailout, as steel is more or less asking every uh, government for a bailout. In Germany, they were confident enough to make that loan conditional on the steel sector reducing its material content, which it ended up doing in its own way. They weren't micromanaged through repurpose, reuse, recycle through the whole value chain. Today, the German steel sector is one of the most green and innovative in the world, not because you know, they went to the World Economic Forum and talked about purpose, but because they had to in order to access the public loan. And that's a really interesting thing that started to be applied with COVID-19 recovery funds in some parts of the world, like in France, where both the uh, airlines and automotive industries uh, received their recovery bailout conditional on uh, reducing or committing to reducing their carbon emissions. Whereas in the UK, we just gave a massive handout you know, to EasyJet, no conditions attached. So that issue of conditionality, I think, is a really interesting concrete example of how to foster this new partnership. And unfortunately, the word conditionality sounds negative. So I do think we need to think the narrative as well around partnership, you know, uh, purpose driven social contracts. Yes, it could just be contract as opposed to conditionality. Yeah, it's just contract. Ter terms of the contract. <laughs> a deal. <laughs> a deal. <laughs> um, Look, I think, I mean, obviously, 
you're you're most familiar or you've spent more time um working with policymakers in, in Europe because and then in some sense uh, there's a more sort of an easier audience there and at least in some countries people really want to change the way public and se sector and private sector work clearly the really the really tough challenge these days is the US after decades of uh, undermining um, the perceived value of government. Only little corners, NASA, I mean, as Michael Lewis points out in his book, it's, NASA was sort of one of the few bits of government that was allowed to take credit as a public sector organization. Everyone else had to be, you know. But not a up. penny, not a penny. Right. They're, they're not allowed to make a penny of profits in space. So Elon Musk can go there, play on the back of a huge infrastructure. Um, but, you know, we risk, we socialize the risks, but privatize the rewards. But if you're if you're facing that, which existed long before Donald Trump, and that now coming in as the Biden administration with the particular record of the sort of acceleration of the undermining of government that's happened over the last few years, I guess there will there is there is a sort of a debate, obviously ongoing within the administration in lots of areas about whether the best thing to do is to be quietly competent and just remind people that the government can be quietly competent and doesn't need to ruin your life, um, and is actually quite important. Uh, or does it need to be visionary? And of course, a lot of people would say you have to be competent and visionary, but they might sense in the kind of way that you talk about this, a real risk for them, that if they try, if they set those enormous targets and, and seem to signal that they're going to completely transform the way we think about government and have your kind of approach, they'll be setting themselves up for this fail for a failure, an equally grand failure which could undermine the battle kind of longer term. So I just wonder when you think oh. about the challenges that the administration faces and this trade-off between being competent and being visionary, how would yeah. you apply your approach? Um, great question. And, you know, and first of all, we should remember that Trump was quite unique <laughs> in case people didn't know. Uh, <laughs> Trump was actually the first president that really attacked what I called the entrepreneurial state. So one of the first things he did was um, go after ARPA-E, the equivalent of DARPA, but in the Department of Energy, much lower budget, but still quite ambitious, you know, very innovative around battery storage, for example, as well as PBS, <laughs> or actually it was Mitt Romney when he was running uh, as well. He went after a big bird. This was all fertile territory. The yeah. territory was prepared by many before Trump, though. That was why yeah. he was able to do it. Yes, but it's, it's false to think that, you know, the whole kind of Reagan Thatcher period that many people associate with an attack on the state, that, that's sort of sloppy thinking, actually. If you look at the data, um, there was huge amounts of public investment under Reagan, not in the welfare state, that he definitely attacked, as did Thatcher, but what I call the innovation state, the entrepreneurial state, he definitely increased those budgets. But one of the things I've been arguing is that in the US especially, but also globally, we need to bring together these concepts of, of the welfare state and the innovation state. They can actually work together, and the welfare state can also be a demand pull <laughs> for what then the innovation state also uh, feeds in. So in the US, it's very dysfunctional. You have, again, 40 billion a year going in uh, from the National Institutes of Health. And then at best you have Medicare and Medicaid on the sort of demand side, but they're not really aligned. And that's why we get this whole kind of hyper inflated system where the prices and the fees don't reflect at all that public sector risk taking. So, I mean, Biden's agenda, which isn't just his, by the way, he, he always gets credit with the concept of build back better. That was already being talked about globally before he became president. But he's, you know, it's very important he's talking like that because Trump, basically was running on a mercantilistic agenda. In other words, brought us back to the 1600s when we had the you know, navigation acts in 1651. All his attention was on exchange rates, trade, trade barriers, walls. When, when Biden's bringing back the attention to an industrial strategy and innovation strategy and the investments that we require in both uh, social, physical infrastructure and innovation, that's an important first step. What he needs to avoid is making this kind of an old style, just list of sectors, you know, make America great again in X, Y, and Z areas. What the mission oriented approach suggests is that we need to remember that some of the best innovations in the US, like all the ones that I mentioned before, making this thing smart and not stupid, internet, GPS, and so on, these were outcomes of the US government trying to solve a problem. So the internet was a solution to trying to get the satellites to communicate. GPS, similarly, there was a problem, GPS was a solution. So the real question is, how can the American kind of industrial innovation system, which did make it great, you know, they really were the leaders around the compute, you know, uh, computer revolution, et cetera, what are the 
you know, what are today's problems and questions that can drive that real kind of dynamic innovation by both the public and the private sector. And by the way, Bell Labs, which was a very innovative private sector uh, research and development laboratory inside at and it's so interesting to look at its history. It came about in a period where the US government was much more confident to strike these deals, as we were saying, you know, the contract. So in order for at and to retain its monopoly status, the deal was that they had to reinvest their profits back into the economy, back into um, innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. And Bell Labs was the answer to that. And so, you know, thinking through what it would look like for the, the build back better uh, and a revived industrial innovation strategy, not just to be a random list of sectors that the U.S. says it's going to lead on, but to really formulate important problems that all sectors, you know, are going to innovate and collaborate around and the role of the public kind of investment leading and crowding in bottom up those different initiatives is in fact what, again, got us to the moon. And lastly, you know, we need to remember when you talked about the US government perhaps getting blamed for any failures that happen along the way, that's normal. You know, it's impossible to innovate without screwing up. But the only difference is that the venture capitalists brag about it, rightly so. You can't have success without also admitting that you're going to fail. And what the venture capitalists do, however, is they make sure they're not just kind of, you know, uh, picking up the downside. They're obviously also getting an upside that gets reinvested back in. That's where the U.S. government in the past kind of, you know, didn't uh, follow through. So even if you look at the recovery after the financial crisis, when Obama had an 800 billion stimulus program, much of which was initially green directed, that's when he brought in a, a Nobel Prize winner to direct the DOE, Steve Chu, who set up ARPA-E. They made all sorts of investments in different companies to foster a green transition. Some of those companies failed, like Solyndra. Some succeeded, like Tesla. Tesla and Solyndra got the same, almost the same amount of money. Um, and the strange thing is that even though Obama had all these Goldman Sachs guys in government, he said something that was quite silly. He said to um, Elon Musk, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. Now, the loan was paid back in 2013. It was taken out in 2009. And had the government said what a venture capitalist would say is if you succeed, we get equity, we get 3 million shares. The, the, the change in price per share was 9 to 90. That multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss in the next round. So the point here is that you don't want to just be choosing kind of siloed projects. You want to choose a direction. You want to pick the willing, not pick the winners, pick the willing along the way, but also structure it in an intelligent way so citizens aren't just kind of bailing out the downside, but also getting a share of the upside. And that can be done in different ways. It's not just a monetary thing. It also is about how you govern the innovation system. I already mentioned patents. It could be around conditionality of reinvestment, so you don't get an ultra financialized model. But it can, in some cases, also be in terms of equity stakes and so on. And you know, COVID-19 is bringing this up to the fore. The FT has even talked about equity stakes after 10 years that I proposed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are gonna run out of time and there are loads of questions and you're gonna to have to answer them much more briefly if we're gonna get through any of them. So uh, let me, there's a, a let me, there's gonna be at least a couple and both of them are quite big, but you'll need to, to shrink them down so that we don't run out of time. There's, I should say, I should record on all these questions, lots of aberration, lots of references to you rule and various oh, other things. Cool. Um, like that. Read watching. them out. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, one question that uh, Jennifer Bay had uh, is how can we engage the average person or consumer, particularly to incentivize or steer consumer facing companies to make more stakeholder oriented decisions? So how do you get how do you get citizens engaged in this process? That's a really important question. And I think, you know, one of the issues is how can you make this proactive? So it's, it's not just I'm not going to buy from a you know, company that's not good. And so, you know, that does, I think, I mean, because because we also need that, and you know, there's been there's been you know boycotts of certain types of products, you know, in in different industries, or even boycotting certain countries. Remember uh, South African apartheid when there was a boycott on those kinds of issues. Um, I think what we need for for missions, coming back to this issue of co-creation and co-design, is to think about what does it look like to bring citizens again to that pre-distribution phase. And that requires not just people kind of acting as individuals, saying what they think or, or, you know, looking at their own consumption patterns, even though that's very important. Consumption, you know, recycling is a great thing to do. It will be a fundamental part. 
uh, in terms of consumer behavior to green transitions. But I do really believe that coming back to my labor union point, we also need organizations, right? Citizens organizations. And that's why I come back to that point of citizen assemblies or other forms. Uh, you'll know, Stephanie, that with Brexit, citizen assemblies actually were quite important in terms of fostering debate. And I just think, especially with the recent history of you know, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and Fridays for the Future, these are three examples of movements you know, uh, uh, really kind of rising up and, and fostering a very stark uh, and, and strong, not a harmonious, you know, in terms of the debate that it um, engendered, um, contestation of the kind of society we want. And so one of the questions is, how can we bring those movements to the table to foster a stakeholder uh, value perspective? Because markets in the end, as I mentioned in the beginning, are outcomes. Markets are outcomes of how we govern all the different value creating organizations and how they relate one to another. And currently those relationships are as sick <laughs> as the, the governance mechanisms within the organizations because there isn't actually, um, you know, what, one of the things I focus a lot on is the civil service, how they're trained, the public servants globally. They're not actually trained really to listen and to work with citizens. You know, um, it's, it's, it's often tokenistic. You have consultation processes, but they, they really are just a box ticking exercise. So I think if we're going to have a proper citizen engagement um, and, and consumers in terms of one of the types of organizations affecting this change, it also requires a change in how civil servants themselves are trained to interact with citizens. It can't just be one sided. Okay, well, final question, but we're, although we are we are going to run out of time, so you're going to have to be be even briefer. It's variations. That, there's lots of versions of this question uh, which have come through, which is kind of, it sounds like uh, nothing's going to be fixed until everything's going to be fixed. You know, you have a wonderful, or economists would put it, you know, you have a very general equilibrium way of looking at the world, um, which is very, it is immensely helpful in thinking about how one thing relates to another and the need to be more holistic. But how should, again, the Biden administration take on the what you're saying yeah. whilst also allowing there to be sort of short-term practical wins along the way so i mean i usually get accused of the opposite that i'm too practical and concrete <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know the big point of course is that economic growth has not just a rate but a direction that's what we're talking about that's like the big broad point which one could argue is kind of too generic the concrete point point is how do you render really explicit that directionality what does it mean for the concrete ways that we design things like procurement. And procurement, by the way, is a huge percentage of government budgets. In the UK, where you and I live, the whole innovation budget of the country is 10 billion. Just the procurement budget of the Ministry of Transport, the Department of Transport, is 40 billion. And this is true almost you know, globally. It's often almost half of the whole government budget. So what does it mean to unpick those contracts, to make them really have purpose, You know, a green transport system, and designing that procurement in order that it really crowds in business investment, because this isn't about the state kind of doing everything. It's about choosing and, and really choosing very specific areas. Also, you know, whether it's health or digital platforms, the vaccine, where we can unpick where things go wrong and redesign the contracts themselves to foster a purpose-driven kind of orientation. But also the public investment side has to do much more than just incentivize. You know, this is why if we simply had R&D tax credits, we would not have had the internet revolution. It required active public investment. It, it was ambitious. It was bold, which then created a whole new kind of you know, market opportunity, which then raised business expectations of where future growth opportunities lie. And unfortunately, so much tax policy, and, and I often go very concrete on different types of tax policy, like capital gains, tax policies, simply increase profits. They don't actually create what economists call additionality, catalyzing investment to happen where it wouldn't have happened anyway. And having you know, proper metrics uh, about additionality, but also the kind of partnerships that we are fostering, whether they're predatory or symbiotic or mutualistic, that needs just as much attention as kind of ESG uh, types of targets. And by the way, there's none. There's no proper metrics, and this is something I, I'm trying to help businesses with, to um, monitor their own relationship with other actors, for example, government. And a lot of government money, so much government money gets wasted picking up the mess. 
that could be actually invested in things we care about, whether it's public transport, public education, and so on, if you don't get these relationships right, it's also a waste of public money just to sweep up <laughs> the mess that we create instead of being much more uh, uh, proactive around um, problem solving. Mariana, we could talk a lot more, and I could certainly have asked you a lot more of the questions that have come through, but it's a call to arms, and I think very much in the spirit of this uh, of the whole of these two two and a half days, thinking about how we could just how we can, in a practical sense, think about how to reset the US economy and indeed every other economy. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for everyone for listening and for all your questions. And I hope you'll continue to to tune in for more of these breakouts and plenary sessions. But thank thanks, you, Stephanie. Ariana. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>